Let me pray for us and we'll jump right into it. Father, again, thank you for this chance to open your word. Thank you for this opportunity to study it. Lord, thank you that even though here we are in the last few days, right before Christmas, we still got a room full of folks and others who are watching online who are ready to hear from you and allow you to speak to us and teach us. Lord, thank you for what you've been showing us as we have been beginning this study. And we're in chapter two now of this wonderful, wonderful book of Romans. Lord, I thank you for the fact that almost every aspect of the Christian life is covered from the gospel all the way through to your plan for for the ages is is revealed here. So, Lord, tonight in the aspects that we're going to look at, the part of the study we're going to be looking at tonight, give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear, and may we walk out of here excited and at peace because of the things you've shown us and what we've done in response. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 29. Paul goes on and says, Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things, and then do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. On that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. But if you call yourself a Jew... And rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law. And if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then, who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. For circumcision is indeed of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision, but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Now, as you probably can tell, we have a lot to break down and unpack here tonight. Paul, though, if you've been with us, has already laid out that this in this letter, and he's going to clarify it at the end of this letter, as we're going to take a look at in just a second, that God's salvation is for everyone. We need to remember, as we deal with chapter 2, Paul has already made very clear that God's salvation is for everyone. Go back to Romans 1, look again at verses 1 through 6. It says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name, where? 
among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Look at verse 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Jump with me to Romans chapter 16. In Romans chapter 16, look at verses 25 through 27. He ends this letter by saying, Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but now has been disclosed, and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith. To the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. So Paul has made clear and is going to reemphasize at the end of the letter here that salvation is for everyone, Jew and Gentile. But as we saw earlier in our study a few weeks ago, the Jews had more light or more revelation from God about this gospel, even though the Gentiles had enough to believe and be saved. We've already been looking at that. Let me remind you of that as well. The Jews, when it keeps talking about the Jew first and also the Greek, it's not because God likes the Jews more. Oh, and I'll save the Gentiles. It's always been available to everyone. But in God's plan, he revealed more of himself to the nation of Israel so they would be his witnesses and his, and his, and his mouthpieces, if you will. We'll get to later on how they kind of missed that. But they had more light. Go back to Romans 1 again. Look at verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To who? First, though. To Jew first and also the Greek. Jump down to Romans 3 and look at verses 1 and 2. What advantage has the Jew or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. Jump down to Romans chapter 9. Look at verses 1 through 5. Paul said, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are the Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Earlier in our study, we've laid this all out. The Jews had more revealed to them. The Gentiles have enough to be saved, in which we're going to talk about tonight. But the Jews even had more. But with more revelation comes what? More responsibility and a stricter accountability. Because we're all going to be judged according to how much God has revealed to us. Folks, what does that say about the United States of America? I mean, the way this nation was founded, and the way the nation was started, and we've had a lot of light. But now we're going the other direction. We're turning away from him. We're de denying him. We're going against his word, against what has been revealed to us. And the judgment on our nation, which I, has, I believe in many different ways has already begun, is going to be stricter than it will be for other nations. But unfortunately, the Jews interpreted their privilege from God as making them, quote unquote, privileged before God and better than the barbarian Gentile world. They saw themselves as the chosen as special in God's eyes. They spent their time pointing out and judging other nations, pointing out the, the, na the sins of other nations. And since they had God's written word, they looked down around those around them who didn't know the things that they knew and they judged them as less valuable than they were in God's sight. All the while ignoring their own sin. Now, before we go any further, we have to acknowledge that kind of pictures the church a little bit over the years lately, hasn't it? We've got to be careful as we take a look at what we're looking at. God's going to be talking to all of us tonight. I pray that you allow the Spirit of God to, to encourage you and challenge you at the same time. Because if you allow what we're going to look at tonight to take root in your heart, and you allow God to keep your accounts with Him short, if you will, you'll enjoy Christmas a whole lot more this year. If you know that you won't be spending your time telling God about everybody else, but allowing him to deal with you. Go to Romans chapter 2 again and look at verses 17 through 24. 
He says to the Jews, if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you're instructed from the law, and if you're sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? Why you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. For it is, as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. We all have a tendency to know some of the things about ourselves that we know aren't right or we don't like. But we have a tendency to ignore that and to notice it in everybody around us. Have you ever noticed over the years, even the preachers that have a certain sin they preach on a lot of times, and then later on they found out that that was what he was struggling with? It's a lot easier for us to start pointing it out in everybody else. We do that because it makes us feel better about ourselves. But when we build ourselves up by tearing everybody else down, we're actually ignoring the real problem. And so the Jews, Paul says to them, you guys think you have the law and you're the teacher of the children and you can give sight to the blind because you have all this information. God's revealed himself to you. He's given you his written word. He's revealed himself with the covenants and the worship and all this. And you start feeling you're pretty special. Don't lose sight of the fact that you needed to be saved just as much as those people around you. By the way, Jesus tried to point this out to the Jews. When he was on the earth. Go with me to Mark chapter 7. One of the biggest problems Jesus dealt with when he came to his own. The people of Israel. Remember John chapter 1 says he came to his own and his own did not receive him. In Mark chapter 7 one of the biggest problems we see is that he spent most of his time trying to get the Jews to realize they're in need of a savior just as much as the Gentile world. Mark 7 verse 1. Now, when the Pharisees gathered to Jesus and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they washed their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they don't even eat unless they wash. By the way, this isn't a COVID-19 thing here. Where you, have you washed your hands? This was a ceremonial type of washing where they had specific rules about how they were to pour the water and have it drip down off the fingers. And then they would do it on the other way. It was a ceremonial way of saying, I have washed all that horrible Gentile sin off of me. I'm clean. Well, the, Jesus' disciples hadn't been doing this. and Verse, verse 5 Actually, go back to verse 4. When they come from the marketplace, they don't eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you? Hypocrites! It is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You, you leave the commandment of God and you hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But if you say, sorry, but you say, if a man tells his father or mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corban, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand there's nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. He said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? Don't miss this, folks. Thus he declared all foods clean. A lot of people, if you even ask preachers today, when is the first time God declared all foods clean in the New Testament? 
They'll say, Acts chapter 10, where Peter had the vision. No, remember what Jesus says to Peter in the vision. He said, what I've called clean, don't call unclean. In other words, I've already called the Gentiles clean. Don't call them unclean. Because here is when he'd already declared all foods clean. He said, it's not what goes into you that makes you unclean. It's what comes out. Why? Because what comes out of you comes from your, from your heart. And that's what God's looking at. Keep reading verse 20. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and they defile a person. You see, the Jews had this mindset that as long as they didn't touch certain things or eat certain things, they would be righteous by their actions. And God says, all this time, you think you know stuff that all these people around you in the marketplace don't know. You think you're so much more special because you don't do this and you don't do that. But all along, God's been looking at the heart. It's not the letter of the law. It's the heart of the law. That's why sometimes when David went and ate the bread that he wasn't supposed to eat according to the law. He wasn't breaking the law because the heart of the law was not being broken. It was the letter of the law. And Jesus himself even pointed out, don't you realize that David ate the bread that the law said not to eat? Again, when God says, thou shalt not, there's a heart of the law. There's a meaning behind it. There's a depth to it. There's the things that are best for us. And if you think you can get closer to God by being good, you totally don't get it. And unfortunately, if you're duped into thinking you can get closer to God by being good, you then start duping yourself into thinking you're getting good at it. And then all of a sudden you start noticing all the people around you. When we all need to be reminded that it's his grace. That's why Jesus, when the woman who had lived a sinful life came and poured the ointment on Jesus and washed his feet and wept. The Pharisee in that house said, if this guy really were a prophet, he'd know what kind of woman was touching him. Jesus said, let me ask you a question. He said, there are two people. One was forgiven a great big debt. Another was forgiven a little debt. They were both forgiven. Which one will love the master who forgave him more? And the Pharisee said, well, the one who had been forgiven the greater debt. And Jesus says, you've judged correctly because those who have been forgiven much, love much. Those who have been forgiven little, love little. Here's the problem. James chapter 2 verse 10 says, if you're able to keep the whole law, yet stumble at just one point, you're guilty as if you broke it all. So is there someone that's been forgiven little? According to the scriptures, even if I keep the whole law, I stumble at one point, I'm guilty in the eyes of God as if I broke the whole law. So what was Jesus saying? He's saying those who realize they've been forgiven much, love much. Those who think they've been forgiven little, love little. And folks, let me tell you, as a pastor for many years, I've been in full-time preaching ministry since I was 19. Getting close to 57. Do the math. You know one of the biggest things I've run across with church people? It's people that have been in church a long time and have lost sight of how much they've been forgiven. Because they've been walking with Jesus and I've been a good church member and I'm faithful and I, I, I. Folks, one of the greatest ways to live your day is to daily remind yourself, God, thank you for my salvation. It is a gift that you gave me, not anything I earned. And thank God you put your spirit within me because I, even though I've been sealed by you, I still wrestle against this flesh. That's why Paul would continue to call himself the chief of sinners. That's why Paul would say, the things I want to do, I don't. The things I don't want to do, I do. Who will save me from this body of flesh? Thank God for Jesus Christ. Folks, don't ever lose sight of the fact that you're just as lost apart from Christ as all those people out there that are doing all these horrible things. We can look at the news and look at all the looting and the smash and grabs and all the murders and all the rapes and all these things. And we can start thinking we're better you don't know the wickedness of your own heart if you think you wouldn't end up in that situation apart from Christ. And that would help you share the love of God. And this is what Paul's trying to get the Jews to understand and the Gentiles as well. Look at chapter 2, verses 25 through 29. 
This is what Paul's saying here at the end of the letter. He says, circumcision is indeed of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man, so if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will his, not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Folks, if you're saved... All has to do with what Jesus did for you. Not anything you've done. I've talked to too many people and I've asked them, if you died today, would you go to heaven? And they say, well, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure. Well, I'll come. Well, I believe in Jesus and I've lived a good life. Ooh, careful. If you think you brought any part to the, to the table, you're in trouble. Now, in getting to the conclusion, though, which we just jumped to in this chapter, Paul first took the time to point out a couple of things to the Jews that will help us as well, since we in the church tend sometimes toward a wrong attitude towards how God feels about the sinners in the world around us. So there are three things I want to pull out from here tonight that I want you to write down that will help you in this. Number one, be not quick to make judgments about others without first allowing God to examine your heart. Again, look at Romans chapter 2 verses 1 through 5. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, that you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you suppose or presume on the riches of his kindness? And the forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Let me say this to you again. Don't be quick to make judgments about others without first allowing God to examine your heart. Go to Matthew 7. This is one of the most quoted passages of scripture now, by the way, in the world. It's quoted by a lot of people that don't even know the Word of God, but they can quote this one. I've heard it. Judge not, lest you be judged. Let's take a look at what it actually says. Matthew 7, look at verses 1 through 5. Jesus says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment that you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but don't notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. By the way, the Bible doesn't say never ever make a judgment. Galatians actually, chapter 6, says that we, we, there are some of us who are to do that. Go to Galatians 6. Galatians chapter 6, look at verses 1 through 5. It says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, by the way, this doesn't mean they made it a, a sin, but they're actually caught in one. Kind of trapped, doing it over and over. And you who are spiritual should restore them. You who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Oh, but keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. But each one, let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each one will have to bear his own load. So the Bible actually says there are times that we are to go, if we see someone caught in a transgression, we're to go and restore them, but do it in a spirit of gentleness and try to help them. But never as a judge, and I'm better than you, and I'm going to show you how I'm living my life, and you need to live like me. No, actually, I'm going to encourage you, don't make judgments until you've gotten really, really good allowing the Spirit of God to show you your heart, and you actually can live in an attitude that says, I don't look down on my brother or my sister who's doing this because I have the same type of problems inside of me too. A lot of people have an attitude toward homosexuals 
and their homosexual tendencies and their sin. And it is sin. But let me ask you, heterosexuals, do you still struggle with temptations when it comes to heterosexual sin? To think for a second that, well, their sin is worse. No, adultery is still adultery. Pornography is still pornography. Fornication is still fornication. Don't allow the world to go down that road and say, I was born that way. No, we're all born that way. We're all born with temptations to sin. Some are tempted to have sex with the same uh, rate, uh, same. Gender, thank you. I've gone race and species and it wasn't working. And in same gender, others are having tempted to have sex with the opposite sex more than they're supposed to, or outside of whatever that God has designed. We all struggle in these areas. Well, I don't do that. Well, what do you do? Isn't that what Paul was saying in our chapter? You who make these judgments, do you keep the law of God? We need to be reminded that we still struggle with this flesh. And apart from Christ, there would we go as well. And that makes a difference because all of a sudden, now instead of being judgmental and condemning and blaspheming the name of God, we're actually going to be gentle, kind, patient, loving. When Jesus looked at the crowds, the Bible said he had compassion on them because he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. They don't know any better. And this one, wasn't that what Jesus cried out from the cross? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Stephen, as he was being stoned, said, Father, don't hold this sin against them. Oh, there's a day of judgment coming. That's one of the thing, reasons I believe when you get to Revelation in chapter 6 and you see the souls under the altar who have been killed during the tribulation period, and their attitude is totally different during that time period. They say, how long until you avenge our blood? And they're told to wait a little longer until the rest of their brothers are going to be killed in the same manner. At that point, during the tribulation period, it's the time of God's wrath and judgment on sin. And the attitude of the believers at that time is different. But during this time period, in this age of grace, in the year of the Lord's favor, our attitude should be, Lord, don't take them home yet. So they've had even another opportunity for them to know you. They don't know better. By the way, I've shared with you in the past. Let me remind you of this as well. I've noticed that most of the time in the scriptures when I see humans righteously indignant, they're wrong. Have you ever noticed that? That's why the Bible says don't be quick to speak, but quick to listen and slow to speak. Because man's right anger does not produce the righteousness of God. Martha, Lord, tell my sister to help me. Was she right or was Mary right? Mary was right. Jesus says, actually, Martha, you're in the wrong. Some of the disciples said, Lord, we saw some people out there preaching in your name and they weren't part of our crowd. So we told them to stop. Jesus said, actually, you are in the wrong. Because if they're not against us, they're for us. Lord, do you want us to call fire down on them because they wouldn't let us go through Samaria? Relax. That's another day and another time. And that's not my heart right now. And I'm just going to tell you, chances are real good. Your first reaction when you see something and you get upset about it, I think so-and-so should have done this. Or they shouldn't be. I'm just going to tell you, take a deep breath. There's a strong chance your first reaction wasn't right. And there's nothing wrong with having a humble attitude that says, I might not be right. Lord, help me see this the way you see this. Boy, that'll make you a real good parent. By the way, those of you who are grandparents, have you noticed you started to get it by the time the grandkids came around? Wasn't your attitude toward your grandkids stuff a little bit different than it was with your kids? It was funny, I remember when I started dating Becky, she's one of three girls and she's the oldest and then there's Susan and Julie came eight years later. And when the older girls watched their younger sister grow up in the same house, they noticed the rules weren't as strict as when they were there going through. And they remember, I remember them saying, Mom, Dad, you're letting her do this, you wouldn't let us do that. And I remember her parents saying, yeah, but we're tired now. <laughs> But it was more than that. It was also they had learned some of the stuff we used to get all head up about isn't as important as we thought. 
hopefully we'll all learn this. So number one, don't be quick to judge or make judgments about others without first allowing God to examine your heart. Number two, don't miss the point of God's patience with these sinners. Go back to Romans chapter 2. Look at verse 4. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? By the way, 2 Peter 3, 9, chapter verses 8 and 9, talk about how God's not slow in keeping his promise of coming back, as we would count slowness, but he's patient, wanting everyone to be saved, right? I want to show of hands, and I want honesty here. How many of you have said, Lord, if you want to come, today's good with me? We've all said it. But aren't you glad that he didn't, do that until after you got saved we need to be reminded as much as we groan inwardly Romans 8 says those of us who have the first fruits of the spirit groan inwardly waiting for our adoption as sons as much as we all want to get out of his body and go be with the Lord which is better by far as much as all of us struggle with sin and get tired of living in this life and man I just want to be there don't lose sight of the fact that he waited until you got to be a part and as much as you're so grateful he waited in for me till 1973, you all need to keep that in mind. The fact that we're still here is because there's more he wants to know him. And his patience is to lead them to repentance. God could have judged everyone's sin the moment they committed the sin. But God's patience with sin shows his love for us. Let's go to Romans chapter 5. Again, look at verses 6 through 8. I love the fact that if I wanted to, I could teach the book of Romans using only the book of Romans. But I also love the fact that the whole book deals with this. Romans 5, look at verses 6 through 8. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He goes on further and calls us his enemies at that time. When did he die for you? When you were still a sinner. Now, go to Romans chapter 3. We're going to deal with something that I hope we have time to allow the Spirit of God to, to bring this out for us tonight. Go to Romans 3. Look at verses 21 through 26. And then we're going to see in Acts 17, Paul say it again in another way. Romans 3, 21 through 26. He's just talked about how through the law we become conscious of our sin. He says, but now, verse 21, now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there's no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift to the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Now listen closely. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So Paul says, look, Jesus died at the exact time that God had planned for him to die. We all know from Galatians chapter 4 that at just the right time, he was born under the law to redeem those who are under the law. So for God's purposes and his timing, even though lots of people lived before Jesus' birth and lots of people have lived after his crucifixion, he came into the world at just the right time that God had planned. And a lot of people sinned before Jesus came and died for sins. But Jesus' death covers what they did too, as much as it'll cover us. If in the Old Testament, how did they get righteousness? Was it by being good or by faith? Faith in God's provision for their sin as revealed with what they had revealed through the law, through the creation. Anyone that looks to him would be the ones who, was, who are going to be given righteousness and believe what he's promised. Now, in his divine forbearance, he passed over former sins to show his patience and his love. Yet... He's also shown the seriousness of sin by having his own son be put to death for sin. 
So we're going to deal more with that in just a second. Go to Acts chapter 17. Paul clarifies it a little bit more. He's speaking in Acts 17 on Mars Hill to the Areopagus. This is in Athens. And he's been laying out to them about this unknown God they had an altar to. But look at verses 26 to 31. Describing this unknown God that they didn't know, he says, And he made from one man, Acts 17, 26, this, this God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face, and face of the earth, having determined the allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. In other words, God determined when you'd be born, when you'd die. He determined where you'd be born, where you'd live. He's orchestrated all that. That they should seek God. And perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. Now, even as some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Now being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man, the times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Look what he said. The times of ignorance God has overlooked. But now he's made very, very clear who it is that is going to be his judge. And he's given proof that that is the man he's going to use to judge by raising him from the dead. Heaven, have you ever said, aren't you glad you're living on this side of the cross? Where things are a little bit more clear? We have an advantage, being the fact that we already can see now what all had been pointed to. The, uh, Colossians chapter 2, Paul says that the covenants and the, all those things, they, uh, sorry, the, 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 uh, the, the religious worship and that kind of stuff, they were all a picture of what is to come. The reality has been found in Christ Jesus. So, don't think for a second, though, that God's patience with sin is ignoring sin. How can, how can we prove that even though God's been patient with sin, in other words, he had every right to judge you as soon as you broke his law. He's holy, and he had every right to, but he didn't. But how can we keep from knowing or falling into the mindset of thinking that God ignored sin? What's the best way we can know that he doesn't ignore sin? The cross. The cross. Folks, don't let this jump over your head and miss it. The seriousness of sin has been proven by the fact that God sent his own son to pay for the price for your sin. He didn't just send somebody. He himself took on human form. He's always existed in three persons. It's, he, God didn't at one time all of a sudden say, boop, I'll become Jesus, and boop, I'll add the Holy Spirit. He's always existed in three persons. There's always been one God. But he's always existed. That's why back in Genesis, let, God said, let us make man in our image. Even though Deuteronomy says there is only one God. He's always existed in three persons. And God, before the foundation of the world, had planned that he would send the Son to die for the sins of man. Don't think for a second that sin is just going to be ignored. No, it has to be dealt with, and it has been dealt with. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. Has he been patient with people who are sinners? Very much so, and it shows his patience. He's been patient with you and me. And he's being patient with them because he wants them to come to repentance. But don't ever think that, oh, well, he'll just let it go. He can't. He's already proven that. Hebrews 10, look at verses 26 to 31. It says, For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries, Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, this is a passage of scripture that's been used by a lot of preachers to say, you could lose your salvation. That's not what it's talking about at all. 
The Bible is extremely clear in so many places that if you have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit, and you will never lose that salvation if God has sealed it. There's a big difference between saying, I believe and I was baptized and having been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus himself in John chapter 6, I think it's around verse 35, said, I will lose none that the Father has given me. So folks, if you have been sealed by the Spirit of God, you are eternally secure. When it talks about going on sinning deliberately after receiving a knowledge of the truth, it's talking about people who have heard the gospel, who know the only way to be saved is through faith in Jesus Christ. They actually understand that and they reject it. That's why it talks about those who have tasted of the heavenly gift in Hebrews chapter 6. Let me ask you a question. Um, are there things that you've tasted but you didn't swallow? There's a big difference, isn't there? There are those who have had their eyes open to the gospel and the truth, that their only way they can be saved is through Jesus, and they still deliberately reject it. Well, listen closely, as you're going to see this later on in our study. We're going to be judged according to all that we've done. If we've not had our sins covered by Jesus, we're going to be eventually judged for everything we've ever done. You, you don't want to be in that condition. Thank God I'm not going to be. But at the same time, if you reject God's sacrifice for your sin, you've just added another one, which is the biggie. You've trampled underfoot the blood of the covenant, which sanctified you. Wait a minute, Jim. I thought they, you said they weren't saved. How are they sanctified? Well, go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 real quick. Second Corinthians 5, chapter 5, look at verse 19. And we'll start in verse 18, actually. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, don't miss this. In Christ, God was reconciling who? The world. Not just the people that were going to be saved. God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we're ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time, I listened to you in a day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid for the sins of the whole world. In the eyes of God, the payment has been made. Forgiveness has been paid for. Now the message of the gospel is be reconciled to God. Believe, receive, don't receive this in vain. And if you say, nah, I know, but I'm not, I, I think I can do it. You have just rejected the only way you can be made right with God. There's no other sacrifice for sin. You've trampled underfoot the blood of the covenant. And buddy, on the day of judgment, when you stand before the creator, and he not only pulls up the book that listed all the things you've done in every little idle word, and then says, oh, and by the way, bigger than all that, I opened your eyes to what my son did for you, and you thumbed your nose at it? The Hebrew writer says, when people broke the law, they were judged just by having a couple of witnesses. How much more judgment do you think is going to be deserved by the one who was trampled underfoot? The blood of the covenant which paid for their sins. Don't miss the point that God's patient has sinned, but he also don't think that he's ignoring sin. Were you about to say something? Everybody has in some way, and they will be judged according to how much light they've had received. Everyone next Sunday has rejected it. Every unbeliever is facing this, yet they're going to be judged according to how much God had revealed to them. Yep, you're right. Everybody knows. And you're going to see that in just a second. Now this leads us to the next thing that Paul points out to the Jews about themselves and the uneducated Gentiles. Here's the third thing. Each individual will be judged in accordance with how much light and revelation God has given them. And everyone, everyone's works will give evidence as to how they have responded to that light, whether appropriately or inappropriately. Let me say it to you again. 
Each individual will be judged in accordance with how much light and revelation God has given them, and everyone's works will, be, will give evidence as to how they have responded to that light, whether appropriately or inappropriately. Go back to Romans chapter 2, look at verses 6 through 16. Romans chapter 2, verse 6, He, God, will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first, and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law, but by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. On that day, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. Wait a minute, didn't Paul say in Acts 17, he's not only set a day of judgment, he's proven whom he's going to judge the world through raising that man from the dead? What about all those people who say there's many ways to God? What about those who say, well, you Christians, you get to God through believing in Jesus, but the Buddhists can get to God through there and stuff and the other. No, there's only one way to the Father, and that's through Jesus Christ. He is the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Jesus. Don't fall prey to the attitude of there's many ways. The Bible is very clear over and over, there's only one way. And God will judge everyone through Jesus. Did you catch that? We sat around talking about, what about those who never heard? There's no such individual. And all those people in all of history will be judged according to how much light that they have been given about Jesus. Don't lose sight of the fact that at the moment Adam and Eve committed their first sin in the garden, immediately in chapter 3, verse 15, God starts telling the gospel. That a descendant or seed of the woman is going to dis destroy Satan. He's already started to begin to reveal his truth. It's been there from, ever, from the beginning. And if you are humble enough to seek good, what happens? God reveals light and he'll bring you to him. And you'll have a chance to believe. But if you are self-seeking and live for yourself, you're going to miss out on it. But if anybody notice, once again, we see twice now that phrase, to the Jew first and also the Greek? Isn't that interesting? Look at the context. As we saw earlier in our study, the Jew first reverts to the privilege of, of more light. In the same way, it's the same thing. He's going to judge every human being, the Jew first and also the Greek. What does it mean? It means simply this. The Jews are going to be held in higher accountability because of how much God revealed to them. They had the law, the covenants, the Shekinah glory, all these different things. They had it all, and compared to the Gentiles, they had a whole lot more light. And remember, they were bragging about that. We have the law, and we're the teachers of children, and, and we're the ones who understand the things that these barbarians don't, and we're going to wash our hands because we might have touched something some of these unclean people around us have touched in the marketplace, and they might have sat on one of these couches, so we've got to wash it before we sit on it because we are holy and pure, and we're God's chosen, and we're not like the rest of these people. Oh, so you've just admitted, Jew, that God has shown you more than the people around you. Yes, yes, he has. Well, that means you're going to be held in higher accountability. Let me just say something along this line real quick to some of you, maybe some of you out there online watching, who love the fact that now through social media and Facebook and all different things like that, you all of a sudden have a platform where you can share with the world your views about God. And there's a bunch of people out there that are claiming to be Bible teachers now. James chapter 3 verse 1 says, Don't seek many of you to be teachers. Because those of us who teach will be held in stricter accountability and higher judgment. The moment you start saying, hey, look at wisdom I have, and I want to share it with the world, 
be careful. Those of us who have been called by God to do this and are gifted by God to do this, we need to take it seriously. That's why Paul, when he even made statements that were bold, he would say, because of the grace given to me, I say to every one of you. I'm only saying this because this is the role God's giving me. I'm doing it humbly. Paul goes on to show that the Gentiles who didn't have God's written law had God's truth revealed to them. He's written his law in their hearts, their conscience. He's shown them and us a moral code and our inability to keep even our own moral code. So he's just said that even though they didn't have the written law, they had a law. What was that law? Their conscience. All right. Keep that in mind. He said that in chapter two. The Jews had the written law. The Gentiles had a, a, an unwritten law, but it was written on their hearts, their conscience. Go to chapter 3 of Romans. Look at verses 19 and 20. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. So before I go any further and read any more, is Paul talking about the Jews or the Gentiles here? You first want to say Jews because you see the word law, but then he says the whole world. So is he talking about Jews or Gentiles or both? He's talking about both. He's just laid out for us in chapter 2 that the Jews had a written law, but the Gentiles had an unwritten, but it was written. He revealed to them that they were lawbreakers because even though all of us are born with a sense of right and wrong, there isn't a person in the world that will say, I've never gone against my conscience. Oh, yes, you have. We all have. And God's shown you you're a lawbreaker. And so now whatever the law written or written on your heart, written on paper or stone or written in your heart, whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under that law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in God's sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Jump over to chapter five. Look at verse 20. Now the law came in to increase the trespass. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. The law was added so that people would sin more? That's what it says. You know why? Because man has a sin problem and they don't realize it. So the law came to reveal it. In other words, Paul said, I didn't even know what coveting was. Until the law said, don't covet. And I've talked about this before. You might be walking down the sidewalk, not even think about stepping on somebody's lawn. But if they have a bunch of signs right on their property saying, stay, don't step on my grass, stay off my grass. Everything in you now goes, I want to do it. You know, that's what's going on. Actually, go to 1 Corinthians 15. It clarifies it for us even more. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 56 and 57. In verse Corinthians 15, verse 56, he says, The sting of, death is, sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. What does it mean the power of sin is the law? What it means is this, is what fuels sin, what empowers sin, is the law. Once you tell somebody, you can't, or you have to, now... When you say you can't, they want to. And when you say you have to, they don't want to. What fuels sin is the law. Hang on for a second. Have you ever noticed how many churches try to correct people's behavior by making a set of rules? By the way, those who raise your kids, keep in mind, you need to have rules. But if you think the rules are what's going to be correcting your children's behavior... Good luck with that, especially as they get older into their teenage years. You just keep trying the rules instead of dealing with their heart. You're going to have rebellion. Josh McDowell years and years ago said very clearly, rules without relationship equals rebellion. God will judge everyone through Jesus Christ. By the way, write this down, look at it later on so we can wrap up tonight. But in John chapter 5, verses 22 and following, Jesus said, The Father judges no one. He's appointed all judgment to the Son. A lot of people think when they stand before the big guy upstairs. No, no, no. They won't be standing before the Father when they die. They'll be standing before the Son. Jesus is the one who will be making the judgments. 
Go to John chapter 16 real quick. There's something you need to see here. In a very familiar passage of Scripture, John 16, verses 7 through 9. In John chapter 16, verses 7 through 9, Jesus is telling his disciples, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away. For if I don't go away, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you'll see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judge. Jesus said, it's good for you that I go away. Because when I go away, then I can send the Holy Spirit and he'll come and he'll be with you forever. Oh, and when he comes, he's going to convict the world. Not your job. You don't have to worry about making people feel guilty for their sin. That's the Holy Spirit's job. And when he comes, he's going to convict the world about sin and righteousness and judgment. Don't miss this. What Did you notice he didn't say sins? He said sin. Singular. What is the sin that sends people to hell? Rejecting the Holy Spirit and not believing in Jesus. That's the sin that people go to hell for. Oh, they'll end up in hell having to pay for all the other things they've done, but you don't go to hell because you committed adultery. You go to hell because you rejected Jesus Christ. Don't miss that. We all have broken God's law. But the reason we're not going to hell is because we believe in Jesus. And that covered everything else. That's why all sin will be forgiven, Jesus said, except one. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And that's when the Spirit of God calls you and you reject Him. If you die in that condition, you not only have rejected the one sin that is not covered by the death of Jesus, now all the others that you've committed, you're accountable for too as well. And he's going to convict the world of righteousness because that's his job. Jesus has gone to the Father. The Holy Spirit's going to be showing what righteousness looks like and the fact that there's a coming judgment. Now, let me show you one more time. Back up here in John 16. Go back to John 6. Look at verses 25 and following. we got time. We can do this. you got two minutes. I think we can do it. John 6, 25. This is after the feeding of the 5,000. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, you're seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may test, see, and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it's not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of, whom sent, who, will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Listen closely. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. They said, what do we need to be doing to be pleasing to God? This is the work God's looking for. Believe in the one that he sent. What we're going to do when we pick up next week, or two weeks from now, when we come back on the fourth, is we're going to deal with, okay, what's God looking for from me now? Well, we'll answer that question when we come back. Until then... I love you. Have a Merry Christmas.